Grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We continue to gather in a new way this morning, apart from each other, but held together by our common love and belief in the triune God who holds us together in faith despite our physical distance. I invite you to join me in worshiping God using this bulletin and the video. Welcome to this space that we are sharing. Ben and his family are away this weekend. My name is Jim Winslow. I am an elder at Howard Memorial. We are delighted that our worship service today has been prepared for us by our music director, Bill Hildebrandt. I encourage you to have the bulletin in easy reach for participation in the service. Worship on the Sabbath is an opportunity to withdraw from the cares of the week, to be still, and to come into the presence of God. The Westminster Catechism, written in 1647, opens with the query, what is the chief end of man? And responds, anyone? to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So let's get at it. The prelude this morning will be the opening uh, by Bill. I think you will recognize it. If not, you might need to spend more time here. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night.
The Lord is with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess how hard it is to be your people. You have called us to be the church, to continue the mission of Jesus Christ to our lonely and confused world. Yet we acknowledge we are more pathetic than active, isolated than involved, callous than compassionate, obstinate than obedient, legalistic than loving. Gracious Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive our sins. Remove the obstacles preventing us from being your representatives to a broken world. Awaken our hearts to the promised gift of your indwelling spirit. This we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. come to the waters, we find that the gift of grace is freely given by our Lord, and our sins are forgiven. but yours as we turn now to the scriptures. May your word be a light unto our feet and a lamp for our path ahead. Amen. The scripture this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 10 verses 40 42. Jesus is instructing his disciples. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple Truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to sing the first verse of Jesus Loves Me as we prepare for our time with children which will be presented this morning by our children's and youth director, Maddie Bedell.
Good morning! In our passage today, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he uses the word welcome six times. What does it mean to welcome someone? It means to greet someone in a friendly way and receive them with joy. We should be people who gladly welcome others. We want to show God's love to everyone and let them know they are valued and cared about. It is important to welcome all people. We are called to tell others that they are gladly received. Jesus told people that when we receive and welcome others, it is like we're welcoming him and welcoming God too. If we can't currently welcome people into our homes, maybe we could send cards and make phone calls and remind others that they are loved and valued. And of course, we can pray. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for welcoming us into your family. We know that you value and care for all people. Help us to be welcoming to others and to demonstrate your love to those in our lives. Amen. During this portion of the service, we'll share a brief history of the hymns before singing them. First hymn is, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in God's excellent word. What more can be said than to you God has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus hath fled. The authorship of this great hymn is a mystery. When John Rippon, pastor of the Carter Lane Baptist Church in London, published a selection of hymns from the best authors in 1787, the attribution for this hymn appeared only as K. Rippon's selection was very popular with 11 editions published in England and one in the US. The hymn came to America and was sung to its original tune, Gayard, and later to the tune of Adeste Fidelis, but did, it did not achieve its great popularity until it was set to an autonomous American borderlands folk tune. This was done in, 1930, in 1832 by Joseph Funk, in his compilation of hymns called Real Church Music. Joseph Funk was the pastor of a German Mennonite congregation in the Shenandoah Valley in what is now called Singer's Glen, Virginia. Singer's Glen is just a few miles from Massanetta Springs, the site of our summer middle schoolers retreat. The hymn achieved great popularity and was sung at the funerals of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Originally written with seven four-line stanzas, five are included in Glory to God hymnal, the one we currently use. The first stanza identifies this as a hymn of promises directly from God. 
Stanzas two through five appear as direct quotations from God. The hymn makes many scriptural allusions. Stanza two quotes Isaiah 41.10 almost verbatim. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The final stanza draws upon several sources, but is especially influenced by Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 and 8. He it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. There are also allusions to 2 Corinthians, the book of Hebrews, and 1 Peter. Regardless of the authorship, we know that this hymn was written by a Christian who was extremely knowledgeable of the promises of God found in Scripture, who most likely called upon those promises for strength in times of tribulation. <laughs> him, what a friend we have in Jesus. That looks like a sober man. I think I'll hire him to cut wood for me. That was said of a man in the streets of Lake Rice, Canada, as he walked along carrying a wood saw and a sawhorse. The response from a man nearby was, that's Joseph Scriven. He wouldn't cut wood for you because you can afford to hire him. He only cuts wood for those who don't have enough money to pay. That seemed to be the philosophy and attitude of Scriven, a devoted member of the Plymouth Brethren Church. He had a sincere desire to help those who were truly destitute. Joseph was born on September 10, 1819 in Ireland. His parents had financial means enough to afford a wonderful educational opportunity for their son. He was enrolled in Trinity College in Dublin, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree. In this young man, Ireland had the prospect of a great citizen with high ideals and notable aspirations. He fell in love with a young lady who was eager to spend her life with him. However, on the day of their wedding, she fell from a horse while crossing a bridge on the River Ban and was drowned in the water below. Joseph stood helplessly watching from the other side. In an effort to overcome his sorrow, he began to wander. By age 25, his travels had taken him to an area near Port Hope, Canada. He became highly regarded by the people of that area. He tutored some of the local children in their schoolwork. It was there he met a wonderful young lady, Eliza Roach and again fell in love. They had exciting plans to be married. However, tragedy reared its ugly head once again and she died of pneumonia before they could be wed. As indicated earlier in this story, he labored in Port Hope among the impoverished widows and sick people. 
He often served for no wages and even shared his clothes with those less fortunate than himself. On an occasion when Joseph became ill, a friend who was visiting with him discovered a poem near his bed and asked who had written it. Scriven said, the Lord and I did it between us. He thought the poem would perhaps bring some spiritual comfort to his mom who still lived in Ireland. Scriven had not intended that anyone else should see it. On August 10, 1886, Scriven's body was pulled from a body of water near Budley, Ontario. Two monuments have been erected in his honor. Each has the first stanza of this song engraved on it. Charles Converse, an attorney and composer, wrote the musical, musical setting used today. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Romans 15.1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Soul by Horatio G. Spafford. With this hymn comes one of the most heartrending stories in the annals of hymnody. The author Horatio G. Spafford, born in 1828, died in 1888, was a Presbyterian layman from Chicago. He had established a very successful legal practice as a young businessman and was also a devout Christian. Among his close friends were several evangelists, including the famous Dwight L. Moody, also from Chicago. Spafford's fortune evaporated in the wake of the great Chicago fire of 1871. Having invested heavily in real estate along Lake Michigan's shoreline, he lost everything overnight. In a saga reminiscent of Job, his son died a short time before his financial disaster, but the worst was yet to come. Hymnologist Kenneth Osbeck tells the story, desiring a rest for his wife and four daughters, as well as wishing to join and assist Moody and his musician Ira Sankey in one of their campaigns in Great Britain, Spafford had planned a European trip for his family in 1873. In November of that year, due to an unexpected last minute development, he had to remain in Chicago, but sent his wife and four daughters on ahead as scheduled on the ship SS Ville de Havre. He expected to follow in a few days. On November 22nd, the ship was struck by the Lochern, an English vessel, and sank in 12 minutes. Several days later, the survivors were finally landed at Cardiff, Wales, and Mrs. Spafford cabled her husband, 
saved alone. Spafford immediately left to join his wife. This hymn is said to have been penned as he approached the area of the ocean thought to be where the ship carrying his daughters had sunk. The tune, Ville de Havre, written by gospel songwriter Philip Bliss, 1838 to 1876, and named after the ship that carried Spafford's daughters to their death. Now the men will sing an arrangement of this great hymn.
The next hymn, Why Should I Feel Discouraged, or better known as His Eyes on the Sparrow, was written by Sevilla Durfee Martin. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Sevilla Martin was born in Nova Scotia and died in Atlanta, Georgia. In His Eyes on the Sparrow, written in 1905, she has provided one of the most influential and often recorded gospel hymns of the 20th century. Martin was the daughter of James N. and Ira Harding Holden, and she was a school teacher with modest musical training. Together with her husband, Walter, they often wrote gospel songs for revival meetings. Be Not Dismayed, also known as Will God Take Care of You, in the United Methodist hymnal is an example of their collaboration. Walter Stillman Martin was a Baptist minister who received his education at Harvard. He later became a member of the Disciples of Christ, teaching at Atlantic Christian College, now Barton College, in Wilson. Before moving to Atlanta in 1919, a location that became the base for the revivals that he held throughout the United States. The song was obviously inspired by Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Later in Matthew, Chapter 10, verses 29 to 31, the gospel writer continues on this theme. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Similar thoughts are cited in Luke 12, Verses 6 and 7. Stanza 2 quotes part of John 14, verse 1, directly, Let not your heart be troubled. Sevilla Martin describes the context out of which the hymn was born. Early in the spring of 1905, my husband and I were sojourning in Elmira, New York. We contracted a deep friendship for a couple by the name of Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle true saints of God. Mrs. Doolittle had been bedridden for nigh 20 years. Her husband was an incurable cripple who had to propel himself to and from his business in a wheelchair. Despite their afflictions, they lived happy Christian lives, bringing inspiration and comfort to all who knew them. One day while we were visiting with the Doolittles, my husband commented on their bright hopefulness and asked them for the secret of it. Mrs. Doolittle's response was simple. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. The beauty of this simple expression of boundless faith gripped the hearts and fired the imagination of Dr. Martin and me. The hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow, was the outcome of that experience. The next day, she mailed the poem to Charles Gabriel a famous composer of gospel songs who wrote the tune for it. The themes of solace in spite of sorrow and a profound sense of being under the watch care of Jesus who is a constant friend, these themes speak to everyone.
Next hymn, Help Us Accept Each Other by Fred Kahn. Help us accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us as sister, brother, each person to embrace. Be present, Lord, among us and bring us to believe. We are ourselves accepted and meant to love and live. During the 1960s and 70s, four English, writer, English language hymn writers emerged on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean and became leaders of the hymnic explosion. Fred Pratt Green, born in 1903, Timothy Dudley Smith, born in 1926, and Brian Wren, born in 1936, all were born in Great Britain. Fred Kahn, born in 1929, died in 2009, though ordained in the United Reformed Church and serving in England, was a native of Harlem in the Netherlands. Together, the four account for many of the hymns written since 1965 that appear in many denominational hymnals. Khan explains the origins of the hymn, Help Us Accept Each Other. The text was set in motion upon reading a Bible study article that had been written by Ms. Jackie Matunin for Cumberland Presbyterian Church in the USA. It was almost accidentally and at the last moment included in the fourth edition of Cantate Domino, an ecumenical and cross-cultural hymnal published by the World Council of Churches in 1974. And so it happened that my hymn of acceptance, hymn of acceptance was just the right length to fill the two blank pages that needed filling. The text appeared in Kahn's collection, Break Not the Circle, 1975, for the first time in the US. The text was first set to the tune Baronita by composer Doreen Potter. This is the tune used in our Glory to God hymnal. She was married to Philip Potter, who served as General Secretary of the World Council of Churches in Geneva. Through that connection, she met Fred Kahn and began writing tunes for his texts. The words became more widely sung when they were set to music by American composer John Ness Beck as an anthem. Beck's anthem setting was then adapted as a hymn tune, Acceptance. This is one of the most powerful hymns on reconciliation and forgiveness composed in the last half of the 20th century. Romans 15, 7 provides a scriptural basis for stanza one. Receive one another then, just as Christ also received you to God's glory. The hymn also reflects Ephesians 4, verse 15. By practicing the truth in love, we will in all things grow into Christ, who is the head. Stanza two asks for grace to accept all people unconditionally. Teach us to care for people, for all, not just for some. To love them as we find them, or as they may become. In stanza three, we find that accepting others changes us. A favorite line in this hymn is a Eucharistic reference to forgiveness followed by the healing power of laughter. Until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter's healing art. We find in stanza four that forgiveness and accept us and acceptance free us and make us one. Khan died October 4th, 2009, after a long struggle with cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Though one of the most prophetic and vigorous voices of the 20th century, hymnody, he has been, though he has been silenced, 
we shall continue to sing his hymns. The congregation is invited to join in on the fourth verse. Him as they they'll know we are Christians by our love. If you've ever been to a youth conference, you know this hymn well. So youth sing out. Written following the Second Vatican Council, 1952 to 1965, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Joins other hymns composed in the vernacular folk style. The accessible melody and folk guitar accompaniment encouraged the full consciousness and active participation of the, of the assembly as set forth in the liturgical vision of Vatican II. Peter Schultes, a Catholic priest serving at St. Brendan's Parish on the south side of Chicago in 1966, penned, they'll know we are Christians by our love when we could not find a suitable song to accompany a series of ecumenical and interracial events for which the youth choir he led was to sing. Like many songs coming out of the 
popular folk music of the 1960s, the song connected to the societal upheaval of that decade. Originally published in the Hymnal for Young Christians in 1966, the song by a Catholic priest, Peter Raymond Schultes, connects participation in communal singing with the charge and benediction to the gathered assembly. The hymn becomes a sung theology of discipleship and action at the congregation's sending. Each subsequent stanza reflects on the what of the community's life together using present participles, walking hand in hand, working together, praising together. The stanzas are anchored by a repeated refrain. The hymn is based on a specific scriptural reason a specific scripture re reference, John 13, 35, which is paraphrased in the refrain of the piece. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. <laughs> faith today is taken from Matthew 22. Please join with me. Our Lord said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
people today is offered as a litany. When you hear me pray, God of justice, you are invited to respond by praying, save your world. When you hear me pray, God of justice, pray, save your world. The Lord is with you and also with you. Let us pray. God of love and justice, you have made it clear to us that you tire of our churchy words and religious festivals and that the worship you want from us is an ethical life lived out in a society that reflects your justice. Hear our prayers for your whole creation, saying, God of justice, save your world. We pray for the church and for all who live by faith, doing charity and advocating for social change. God of justice, save your world. Cultivate peace between nations, between people, between political parties. God of justice, save your world. Protect and comfort those enduring the violence of war, the injustice of crime, or the destructive forces of nature. God of justice, save your world. Preserve those who suffer violence at home or bullying at school. Embolden those who see their trouble to help bring relief and help. God of justice, save your world. Grant your healing mercies to those who are ill or facing death and uphold those who care for them. God of justice, save your world. Delivering God, through Jesus Christ, you come to us and teach us the way of true worship, doing good, seeking justice, rescuing the oppressed, defending the orphan, and pleading for the widow. Set us free to serve you, sharing your work in the world. By the power of your strengthening spirit, through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Even though we cannot gather together for worship, we're continuously invited to give freely, to pay our pledge and keep our tithing. We're also invited to give generously of our time, talent, and resources as they are expressions of our faith in the Lord. Amen.
also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give our best, lest in gaining the world we lose life itself. As a covenant people, we seek to witness to your will and way. Help us to know clearly what you would have us do with the wealth entrusted to our care. As we contribute to the needs of your people, we present ourselves as living sacrifices. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Yeah.